thrilled to introduce Dr. James Lee is head of uh, our adrenal program, our adrenal center here. He also covers our other endocrine surgeries, but for today's, um, really we're gonna focus on the adrenals. Um, he is incredibly talented and gifted, and also I have to say a really nice guy. So I'm glad to turn the podium over to Dr. Lee. Thank you, uh, Wendy. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me here, uh, and uh, thank you for that too kind introduction. Um, so I just have no relevant uh, commercial disclosures here. So by way of overview, I thought we'd talk a little bit about, um, you know, a little bit about the background of uh, adrenal disease and uh, adrenal disease and uh, how we make the diagnosis uh, if a FIO and VHL and how we treat um, these uh, in this day and age. So starting with the background, as you guys know, the adrenal glands are these paired organs that sit on top of the kidneys uh, way back uh, in the back. And they do a number of different things, um, uh, especially just creating a bunch of really important hormones for your body. Um, so when you look at the adrenal gland more closely, um, it's made up of two distinct layers. Uh, the cortex is the outer layer, the medulla is the inner layer. And when you take a look inside of the adrenal gland, uh, what you'll notice is that the cortex has three distinct parts to it. Uh, that make uh, hormones called cortisol, aldosterone, and sex hormones. Uh, in medical school, we remember this as, you know, uh, salt, sex, sweet. Uh, and those are the different types of hormones and their functions. Um, but of course, what we care about is um, the medulla. The medulla uh, is made of chromatin cells. Uh, and these chromatin cells uh, make a group of hormones called catecholamines. Um, so these are better known as epinephrine uh, or adrenaline uh, and norepinephrine or noradrenaline. Uh, and so these are the hormones that uh, get uh, immediate, what we call the fight or flight uh, response. Uh, so these uh, either uh, uh, get you ready to fight your way out of a situation or run away from it. And so tumors that make too much adrenaline or nor uh, adrenaline are called catecholamine secreting tumors. Uh, and they have different names depending on where you find them. So uh, for example, if there is an adrenaline secreting tumor inside the adrenal gland, we call that a pheochromocytoma. Uh, and when they're found outside of the adrenal gland, they're called either extra adrenal pheos or more um, uh, in more modern, uh, modern parlance, we call them paragangliomas. Uh, and these can be found anywhere there are sympathetic ganglia, and these are typically found along the large blood vessels in the body. Um, more, uh, less common, I should say, are the parasympathetic uh, paragangliomas, uh, and these typically um, don't produce catecholamines, and they're usually found in the neck and the base of the skull. Um, so about 85% of all uh, catecholamine or adrenal, uh, adrenaline secreting tumors are pheochromocytomas, so inside the adrenal gland. Um, so the classic symptoms of a pheochromocytoma, uh, high blood pressure, usually this is episodic and sometimes you have uh, quite high peaks, uh, so up into the 200s. Um, sweating, uh, so uncontrolled sweating uh, episodes. Uh, thank you, the, there's one person who uh, recognized this. I felt like an old man putting this uh, <laughs> slide up there. Uh, so palpitations, rapid heart rate, uh, and headaches. So this is the classic constellation of symptoms that you see with pheochromocytoma. And we call these tumors the pharmacologic time bomb uh, because at any point you can release, uh, have a massive release of adrenaline or catecholamines uh, that can lead to things like heart attack, stroke, uh, multi-system organ failure, even death. Um, so important that we uh, recognize uh, and diagnose these early. Um, so of all patients who have pheochromocytomas, about 40% present with that classic constellation of symptoms. About 10% of patients will present in what we call a pheo crisis. Pheo crisis basically means um, they're already in multi-system organ failure. Uh, and this is oftentimes precipitated by, uh, by different things like stress or, or even minor procedures like hernia repairs, biopsies, that kind of thing. Uh, about 10% of patients will be picked up uh, on routine screening. And this is uh, typically in patients who have a family history of genetically inherited forms of the disease. Uh, and about 40% of patients are picked up incidentally, meaning they were having a scan for some other reason and they happened to find an adrenal tumor uh, that um, uh, prompted a workup. And so most patients with uh, VHL will be discovered during the screening process because um, you know, programs like uh, uh, the one that uh, Dr. Chung has put in place have really helped us um, identify family members um, uh, early on in the process and uh, make sure we take care of them appropriately. So uh, when you look at all patients who have pheochromocytomas, not just the genetically inherited, uh, pheos are, are quite rare. So it's about one in uh, every 100,000 patients. Uh, about 1.7% of uh, children who have hypertension will have a pheo. Most of these are sporadic, uh, meaning they're just kind of random uh, mutations that occur, and most of these are benign. Uh, but overall, about 30% of patients uh, with a pheo will have a genetic component associated with it. Uh, 
And as we study the relevant pathways, um, we're finding that the genetic story isn't just as simple as uh, the NF1 mutations, RET mutations, that kind of thing. There are a whole host of different uh, genetic mutations that can cause a theochromocytoma. Um, but of course, you know, what we're interested in are the VHL mutations, and these account for about 11% of all cases of genetically inherited theochromocytomas, and about 30% of uh, uh, children with VOs will have a VHL mutation. Uh, you know, as Dr. McKiernan uh, was telling you, um, we actually um, subtype the type of VHL um, based on your predisposition to forming uh, FEOs. And so um, uh, patients with uh, type 1 really have uh, no risk of FEOs, uh, and there's uh, a reasonable um, correlation with the, the, uh, the mutations that you have. Uh, type 2 FEOs, uh, type 2A um, uh, will have a predisposition to theochromocytomas, uh, but a low risk for renal cell cancer. Type 2B will have a high risk for renal cell cancer. Uh, and type 2C, TOs only, um, really no risk for, um, uh, for uh, uh, renal cell cancer. So when we look at patients specifically who have VHL and uh, uh, theochromocytomas, uh, typically these patients are younger, so about 18% of patients will present um, younger than 30 and oftentimes in the pediatric age range. Uh, and a lot of this data comes from the Mayo Clinic and the NIH um, uh, and their, uh, their cohorts. Oftentimes, patients uh, with VHL will have multiple uh, uh, pheos and periganglioma, so not just in the adrenal, but also outside of the adrenal gland. Uh, and about a third of these tumors uh, are about, uh, excuse me, about 12% of these tumors are extra-adrenal, again, periganglioma's that are outside of the adrenal gland. Um, about a third of these tumors do not produce catecholamines, and this will be important when we talk about screening. Uh, and so, uh, for that reason, patients with VHL are more likely to be asymptomatic uh, than uh, patients in the general population. Uh, and what this means is that any patient with VHL should be carefully evaluated for occult FEOs, meaning um, FEOs that are not uh, clinically uh, or symptomatically evident, uh, prior to undergoing surgery of any kind or other procedures uh, to avoid the risk of, you know, huge adrenaline releases and uh, FEO crisis. So in terms of the diagnosis, I think uh, uh, this may have been mentioned previously, but adrenaline uh, and noradrenaline disappear from your system pretty quickly. Um, and in contrast, uh, catecholamines break down into this thing called metanephrines. Metanephrines stick around for quite a long time. Um, so it's much more accurate to measure the metanephrine levels either in your blood or your urine in order to figure out what your risk for um, uh, having a FEO is. Uh, and so uh, the blood test, what we call the plasma metanephrines, uh, is more sensitive, meaning it's going to pick up more cases uh, than a 24-hour urine uh, metanephrine test will. Uh, so we tend to use the blood test to screen patients with a known genetic disorder like VHL. The other nice thing is that, uh, you know, having a blood test is often more simple uh, than collecting your urine for 24 hours, so patients oftentimes like that better. Um, patients uh, with VHL almost exclusively produce uh, um, what we call normetanephrines, uh, and uh, uh, so they almost uniformly have a high normetanephrine level uh, compared to their metanephrine levels. Uh, and so this is something that we look for uh, as well in VHL. Um, so when we interpret metanephrine levels, what we say is that a positive screening test means that your uh, metanephrine levels are about two to three times the upper limit of normal. And so that has about 100% positive predictive value, meaning if you have that um, result, you almost certainly have a pheochromocytoma. So in contrast, if it's less than one-fold elevated, you almost certainly don't have an active pheo. But again, just please keep in mind that um, some of these um, uh, tumors uh, won't make an excess of catecholamines uh, in VHL. So you know, again, we just have to take that with a grain of salt. Um, and if you're in that borderline category, about 30% of patients will have um, uh, a, pheochromosoma, a pheochromocytoma at that time. So a high sensitivity means that almost all cases of symptomatic catecholamine-producing tumors uh, will be detected by positive results. But this doesn't mean that everyone with a positive test uh, result will have a catecholamine-producing tumor, because there are lots of things that cause what we call false positives meaning um, elevated catecholamine level, uh, uh, metanephrine levels, but without the disease. So for example, um, your testing position is probably the most common reason to have an inaccurate metanephrine level. So um, when, we, uh, when you test for metanephrine levels, what you're supposed to do is you have the patient come in, uh, you put an IV in, you have them lie down flat in a quiet dark room for 30 minutes, uh, and then you draw a sample, the blood sample off of the IV. So that way there's no real stress involved. You don't get a, a quick um, uh, release of uh, catecholamines. I see someone shaking their head in the back. This almost never happens, right? You know, so the first thing they do is 
They bring you to a room, they jab you with a needle, they take the blood sample. So um, the first thing that we should do if you have uh, an elevated metanephrine level, especially if it's a borderline elevation, is repeat the test, ideally under those test conditions. Um, you could do a 24-hour urine um, uh, catecholamine, uh, excuse me, metanephrine collection uh, because that sort of evens things out over the course of a 24-hour period rather than just having one uh, quick sample. So the other thing is age. Uh, we know that as we get older, for whatever reason, our norm metanephrine level goes up um, compared to when we were younger, so that's one thing to consider. Uh, and then there are a whole host of medications that can interfere, uh, either raise or lower your metanephrine levels um, uh, in, uh, inaccurately. So uh, definitely important to take these things into account. Uh, and that's why having a skilled uh, clinician like Dr. Chung and her team critically important for um, uh, doing appropriate screening. So moving on to uh, x-rays. So I love CT scans because they give you a really beautiful picture. And here you can see um, this is a left-sided pheochromocytoma here. Um, the one issue is that if you're going to have multiple uh, tests, multiple CTs over the course of the lifetime, um, that may increase the risk of second malignancies um, from radiation exposure. So we try not to uh, overuse CAT scans. So MRI is a pretty good test um, because it doesn't really have any radiation associated with it. Um, and then uh, importantly, so here you can see this uh, really bright uh, uh, white tumor here. That's a, a pheochromocytoma on the T2-weighted imaging. This is what we call a light bulb um, uh, uh, result because uh, even I can, you know, read this test. Um, so the next test that we typically do is that, uh, is what we call an MIBG because it's important to note that CT and MRI will miss about 10% of patients who have uh, small uh, pheochromocytomas, especially perigangliomas. So MIBG is what we call a functional test. It's a nuclear medicine test uh, that's designed to pick up um, these tumors, especially perigangliomas outside of the um, uh, adrenal gland. Uh, but MIBG is sort of falling by the wayside for a number of different reasons. Uh, number one, you have to prepare patients, so you have to put them on um, an iodine um, uh, uh, supplement to block the um, uh, MIBG from going into the thyroid and causing an issue. Uh, in addition, about 5% of these tests will have false positives, meaning um, you'll have normal adrenal glands, but one adrenal gland will take up more of the tracer than the other, so it'll look like there's a, a positive result there. Uh, and then the other thing, the final thing, is that uh, MIBG isn't quite so good at picking up small tumors. So uh, tumors that are one to two centimeters in size, MIBGs uh, will oftentimes miss, and especially for the extra adrenal uh, paragangliomas that's important. And so, um, again, MIBG is sort of fallen by the wayside, but PET scanning, uh, so again, another um, test, uh, nuclear medicine test, um, has sort of come to the forefront. Um, it has excellent um, anatomic definition. Uh, it picks up almost all of these small tumors that um, uh, we're discussing, and uh, dotatate PET has been shown to be uh, the most sensitive test for picking up uh, small uh, uh, extra adrenal pheochromocytomas or perigangliomas. <clears throat> uh, and so this is a good example. So here you can see this patient has a very clear right-sided uh, pheochromocytoma, but then um, a couple of additional spots of disease elsewhere that, um, you know, uh, MIBG scan missed in this particular patient. So if you take nothing out of today's, uh, my talk today, this is the most important thing to take out of it. Never let anyone biopsy your adrenal gland before they've real, uh, ruled out uh, pheochromocytoma, because even that, you know, um, uh, that gentle biopsy may precipitate a pheocrisis. So again, this is uh, critically important and be your best advocate if someone says, let's biopsy that adrenal, to say, let's please rule out a pheo first. So when we talk about screening, uh, the uh, Columbia uh, protocol, um, Dr. Chung and I were just talking about this, um, many places don't have a set protocol in place which I think is detrimental to long-term screening. You know, I think you have to have a clear roadmap for how you follow patients going forward because, uh, you know, otherwise patients tend to get lost, um, you know, when, um, uh, when they go from institution to institution if they move, you know, uh, city. So I think having a set protocol is critical. So here we recommend uh, plasma in 24-hour urine metanephrines um, uh, early on in life. Uh, and we start to do this, you know, as we think, um, you know, the child is, is able to do so. Uh, between the ages of 5 and 15, uh, plasma metanephrines and an abdominal ultrasound at some point. Uh, abdominal ultrasound has uh, the benefit of having no radiation associated with it. It's pretty good at picking up uh, grossly enlarged tumors, uh, especially in the adrenal glands themselves. Uh, once you're over um, 
uh, 16 and over plasma metanephrines, and typically a yearly plasma metanephrine is a pretty reasonable thing to do. If they're abnormal at that time, then move on to more, um, uh, more imaging like CT, PET scan, uh, et cetera. And so uh, I just wanted to close by talking a little bit about treatment. So uh, this is Charlie Mayo. Uh, he's uh, you know, one of the iconic figures in surgery. So in 1926, uh, he was asked to consult on a Canadian nun named Sister Joachim. She'd been in the hospital for five months with fainting spells, uh, sweats, and a systolic blood pressure to as high as 280. Uh, so the uh, uh, going diagnosis for that five months was that she had an incompetent liver. Uh, but during uh, her stay, a, a, um, an astute urologist got a urogram uh, and revealed a mass that Charlie thought might be the cause. So on October 11th, 1926, uh, Charlie Mayo resected the first pheochromocytoma under drop ether anesthesia. That's when they drop ether onto your face to anesthetize you. Uh, in about 56 minutes. So the really remarkable thing about this operation was the only blood pressure medication they had uh, to maintain her blood pressure was coffee enemas. So um, uh, uh, coffee enemas throughout the operation. And so she went on to live a full happy life teaching music until her death about 18 years later. So um, fortunately for us, uh, we have a much better understanding of how to prepare patients uh, and we have much better drugs to do so. So the key to preparing patients for an operation um, and to block the effects of catecholamines on your body uh, is a medication called an alpha blocker. Yeah, so the alpha blockers, um, you know, catecholamines cause uh, blood vessels to contract in general, uh, and they squeeze down and make the heart beat faster, they make your blood pressure go up, uh, and alpha blockers relax the blood vessels and prevent that ha uh, rapid heart rate. So as you relax the blood vessels, um, your blood vessels actually don't have enough volume in them because, you know, you're relaxing them. So you're actually total body dehydrated. So it's critical that you replace that volume uh, by drinking plenty of extra water and we tell people to take a little extra salt in their diet so we ask them to eat a bag of chips or you know put a little soy sauce on their food um, and uh, after you've successfully alpha blocked uh, patients uh, your doctor may prescribe something called a beta blocker. The beta blocker tends to decrease your heart rate and has some protective effects on the heart um, but if your heart rate's still too fast uh, at this point it usually means that you're still dehydrated, that you have to you know, replete your, uh, your, uh, your blood volume more. Um, so the most important thing, so that if you take two things out of this talk today, uh, never let anyone start a beta blocker on you until, uh, if you have a pheochromocytoma, never let anyone start a beta blocker until after your alpha blocker has been started because that um, beta blocker with an alpha, without an alpha blocker may actually precipitate a pheocrisis. Um, so laparoscopic adrenalectomy is the mainstay of treatment for patients uh, with pheochromocytoma. So back in the old days, uh, uh, to take out an adrenal gland, you had to make a big shark bite like this. Uh, but fortunately, now we can do this um, uh, laparoscopically using three or four small little incisions. And so um, uh, we use, you know, a camera and special instruments. Uh, so it's a much uh, um, more palatable uh, option for patients uh, in this day and age. And there's a whole wealth of data that shows that Patients have better outcomes with laparoscopic adrenalectomy than open adrenalectomy. They recover faster, they go home uh, from the hospital faster, and they have fewer complications. So the classic approach to taking out an adrenal gland is what we call a laparoscopic transabdominal approach, where we go through the belly uh, and uh, we take out the adrenal gland uh, uh, using the, the camera and special instruments. Uh, and this is great because um, you know, surgeons see this view of the world all the time. Uh, we can look around the rest of the body looking for uh, other sites of the disease, especially metastatic disease. Uh, and we can uh, take out larger tumors this way because there's a, a, a pretty big working space. Um, but as you guys have heard, the adrenal glands are way back um, uh, on top of the kidneys. So in order to get to that adrenal gland, you have to move a lot of stuff out of the way, right? You have to move the intestines, the spleen, the, you know, the pancreas sometimes. Um, so it's much faster and easier to go through the back. This is what we call... a uh, uh, a laparoscopic retroperitoneal approach. Um, so uh, for patients who've had prior abdominal surgery, um, it's uh, a great option because you can avoid all that scar tissue. Um, it tends to be faster, fewer complications. Again, patients have uh, less blood loss, they re uh, have less pain, uh, and uh, you can take out both adrenal glands without having to reposition patients. So when I went to learn this technique, just as a, an illustration of how good this technique is, um, uh, I went to see this guy, Martin Waltz, in Germany. Uh, he is the world's master at this operation. And he did 13 adren adrenalectomies in 11 patients between the hours of 8 and 4. We had a, three coffee breaks and a nice sit-down lunch. Um, so incredibly uh, efficient way to take out adrenal glands. And so at Columbia, we've replicated these results. So the average operative time uh, for a retroperitoneal adrenalectomy is about 42 minutes.
Uh, and I'm just going to close by talking about this thing that you may hear about called a cortical sparing adrenalectomy. So uh, the great thing about the adrenal gland is it makes lots of different hormones. One of the critical hormones is steroids, or what we call cortisol. And your body needs uh, cortisol to be, um, uh, to be happy. And so you can get cortisol either from your adrenal gland or pills, you know, prednisone or other steroids. <clears throat> so many people will try and take out just the adrenal tumor uh, when, uh, when they do this operation uh, because, you know, again, you want to try and preserve adrenal uh, tissue. So this is, again, called a cortical sparing adrenalectomy. So the problem is that the adrenal gland is like a peanut butter sandwich, right? So the bread is the cortex and the medulla, the, um, uh, the chromaffin cells, are like the peanut butter. So the peanut butter gets into all those little nooks and crannies in the bread. So if you take out a cortical sparing, if you do a cortical sparing adrenalectomy, you're leaving all of that medullary tissue in there, which um, is at risk for developing pheochromocytoma in the future. Um, so typically, um, this is something that we don't really consider for uh, a first time operation, but for a stage adre adrenalectomy. So if someone has a clear pheo in one gland, but not the other, we'll typically take out that adrenal gland. If they develop a pheochromocytoma in the future in the other, that's when we would consider doing a cortical sparing adrenalectomy. Uh, and then if they develop another tumor in the remnant, uh, then take out the rest of the adrenal gland at that time. And so that hopefully will help preserve uh, normal adrenal function for as long as possible. Uh, and with that, actually, uh, Dr. Chung asked that we hold questions till the end. With that, I end.